Well, good evening and uh, a very warm welcome to you all. And I'm delighted to welcome everyone to what is the fourth uh, Stop MS Appeal Annual Lecture, which is entitled Drug Development for Progressive MS, How Close Are We to Success? Now, as some of, you, some of you may know, I actually joined the MS Society's chief executive um, in January of this year. And having worked in the NHS for the past 15 years, I'm acutely aware of the devastation that neurological conditions such as MS can have on people's lives. And that's why I'm so excited and indeed feel really honoured to be leading the MS Society, which, as you know, is one of the largest charity funders of MS research in the UK. Over its 60 years of existence, the Society has played uh, quite literally a world-leading role in improving the quality of life for people with MS. But we are only able to do this with the help of supporters like you um, and the group that's assembled here tonight. So uh, we're hugely grateful for that support. Now, MS is a disease that stops, stops people often in the prime of their lives. It can destroy lives and devastate families. We know what people with MS want, which in a nutshell is no relapses, no accumulation of disability, and no uncertainty. They want us, in effect, to stop MS in its tracks. And we plan to do exactly that with the Stop MS Appeal. Now, many of you will have heard us talk about the Stop MS Appeal. This ambitious campaign aims to raise 100 million pounds for research over a 10-year period. We're now in the fifth year of the appeal, and the campaign has successfully raised over £43 million so far. But we're not there yet. So the MS Society is very proud to be working with leading scientists, and we'll hear from, in a few minutes from one of our Stop MS ambassadors, Richard Reynolds, who is Professor of Cellular Neurobiology at Imperial <coughs> College and Scientific Director of the MS Society Tissue Bank, um, who we're delighted to be working with. Um, now, uh, on a point of administration, during the lecture, um, if you have any questions you'd like to ask, I'm pleased to say that we'll be using the Slido interaction platform to gather in questions. So if you visit www.slido.com, as uh, indicated on the screen, you'll be able to submit a question using the event code, which is hashtag lecture2019. Selected questions will be answered during the panel discussion. But first, um, before I hand over to Richard Reynolds, I'd be, uh, I'd really, I'm really delighted to welcome Asana Greenstreet, who will give us an insight into her personal experience of living with MS. Asana, welcome. Well, this is really exciting, being here with so many faces looking down um, at me, to talk about... Um, one thing, MS, obviously, um, two letters in the alphabet that became really significant one day when I was 25 years old, sitting in my GP's practice, being told that I had suspected multiple sclerosis, um, which in that moment didn't mean that much, if I'm honest. Um, and now that I try to remember the feelings that I had, um, it's actually quite hard because it's pretty hazy, if I'm honest, through the range of dizzy spells and extreme tiredness and all the MRI scanners. I mean, do they have to be that loud? Can somebody tell me that? <laughs> um, I didn't really know what the disease meant, um, what was happening to my body and how I could stop it. Um, and really the feelings of sort of fear and loneliness really started to grow through the blood tests, the injections, the counter dyes, the MRIs, the complicated medical terminology of myelin and lesions and my consultant talking about disease-modifying therapies, which meant that there was a lot to take on at that moment. Some of the most frustrating things that I experienced um, were when I lost sight in my right eye for about six weeks, um, when my arm fell asleep for about a month. Uh, that was pretty tricky. Thankfully, I had my amazing family and my friends to help me through the everyday basics, like cooking and you know, I had my sister wash my hair for me, which was just fabulous, actually. Um, you know, I remember one of my friends cutting my dinner uh, when we went out for 
we went out for dinner, which was really nice, and he didn't make me feel bad about it. So I had a lot of really supportive people around me, which was great. But I say that I'm one of the lucky ones because I have relapsing and remitting MS, which means that my body becomes close to normal after every relapse. Um, and since 2015, I've been on a really powerful disease-modifying therapy, a DMT, that has worked really well for me. Um, and something that I remember really well is all the support that I had from the MS Society when I was going through my, the initial stages of my journey. Um, I definitely wasn't alone, uh, so thank you so much to everyone who, who was there. Um, it's important to, to note that the MS Society has been a really powerful resource for me, um, such as the so MS Helpline, the staff at all the events who sort of cheered me on, gave me fundraising advice, even receiving Christmas cards from some of them, which is really special. You know, I was invited to a photography exhibition to meet other people with MS. Um, and also being asked to speak here tonight is just really special, so thank you very much. And it just reminds me that I'm not alone in my journey. Um, when I was diagnosed, I promised myself that I'd keep fit. And over the past five years, I've completed two walks, 20K walks with the MS Society, five 10K runs, one 10 mile run, three half marathons, and I will do a marathon one day. I have... <laughs> Thank you very much. I have a friend here in the audience and she will make sure that I do that marathon. So can't get, can't get away from that now. I think tonight feels really special because it feels like we're sort of over the hill in terms of MS research. So much has been done. Um, and I'd say sort of, sort of stop MS and sort of 20 years ago being diagnosed was like a, having a, a life sentence. And now it's just something that people just have and, and live with. And it's something that I run with. Um, so to all of the amazing science brains in this room, thank you so much for everything that you do. It really makes a difference um, and it's changed my life. So thank you, basically. And looking forward to hearing more from what you've got to say. Thank you. Asana, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. That's great. And I'd now like to welcome our speaker for the evening, Professor Richard Reynolds. Okay, well, good evening, everyone. It really is a pleasure and an honor to be here this evening, to follow in the footsteps of my learned colleagues who gave this lecture over the last few years. Unfortunately, they're all sitting in the front row, so they're watching, <laughs> watching me very carefully, which is a little bit worrying. So tonight, what I'm going to be talking about is about one of the major questions in MS research, and that is the development of therapies to either slow or halt progression in MS. And I want to start off by really talking about the success of drug development for relapsing remitting MS. It's been a remarkable success compared to other conditions that affect the brain that have very few treatments, now the MS landscape of drugs has moved right over to this side where there's a large number available. Doesn't mean they're all perfect yet. They have side effects, some of them. So there's still some that are being developed that are going to work their way across here. But it's been a remarkable success story for drug development. If we now look at the landscape for progressive MS, Yes, you can see that there isn't anything really here, but drugs are now making it onto this first part of the slide in phase two clinical trials, whereas if we'd have looked 10 years ago, there might have been one there or nothing there. So what we do know is some of them are going to make it to here. Not all of them by any means, but some of them will make it across, which means things are moving. And those of us who are working in MS research think it's moving more rapidly than it was before. So what I want to do is to really talk about some of the concepts that we've been thinking about and how we develop drugs for progressive MS. And then go on to give you one example from my own research group about how we've tackled this from the first idea through to clinical trials. So you can get an idea of how research 
is done and how it progresses. And it's just going to be one example from my group, and there are many other examples. So, this is one of the classical diagrams we use to describe MS, where we see the relapses, these acute bouts of neurological symptoms that you recover from, or usually recover from. Um, and then, but there's this slow progression as well, and I'm going to be talking more about this slow progression in a moment. But we know that with the drugs that we have available now, we can to some extent put out this raging fire that is our relapsing remitting MS. So Robin Franklin last year was talking about Fireman Sam, and I told him I was going to remind him of this. <laughs> Fireman Sam was able to put out the flames of MS to some extent, but you still had to rebuild the immune system and the nervous system. What I want to tell you is that after you put out the raging fire, Fireman Sam's not done his job completely yet because there's still a smoldering fire going on, and that is the slow progression of MS that we haven't fully tackled yet. So we can get rid of these relapses to degrees, depending on the drug. But we are left with this slow increase in symptoms and disability at a varying rate from person to person. And that's what we are talking about tonight. There's lots of ideas about what might be the cause of this progression, why it occurs slowly over time, whether it be accumulating loss of the nerve fibers within the brain and the spinal cord, particularly the spinal cord, whether it's due to accumulating loss of the nerve cells themselves, the neurons, over time, over decades even, in the gray matter of the brain. And also it's likely to be due to these slowly expanding lesions that you see on MRI where your nerve fibers have had their insulating layer of myelin stripped off, that they slowly expand with time. And there's a failure of myelin repair, and which is what Robin Franklin was talking about last year that we need to speed that repair up. So there's a number of ideas here, and I'm going to dwell mainly on number two there. So we often use the analogy of, of research being like putting together a jigsaw, and I think that's actually a very good one. We put the pieces together until we're nearly there, and we've only got a few smaller pieces to put in place to get success. And I personally think that we're not in a position where we need to find a, a major piece. For those of you who've got sharp eyes, this is Western Europe without the British Isles. <laughs> Needless to say, I found this actually off a German website. <laughs> so this is post-Brexit Western Europe. Although it's a very old map, and in France, apparently, they only produce wine. So perhaps that's true. Um, but I don't think we're at that point where we've got to fill in a major piece of the jigsaw. I think we're more at this kind of level, where we're putting the details in now. The bits of sky that you so hate when you're doing a jigsaw puzzle. So I think that we are moving forwards at a reasonable pace. But if we're going to stop um, progressive MS, we need to know the fine details of what's causing it. What are the molecules and cells doing in the MS brain? so that we can understand how to stop this. I've just put up here five reasonably plausible ideas about what might be involved here. There are others, and I'm just doing this for illustration's sake. There's a slowly increasing myelin loss that I said without repair, and lots of possible mechanisms that we know about that might contribute to that. There's damage to mitochondria. They're the small bits of the cell that generate energy from oxygen and glucose to make ATP. We know that they're damaged in MS. We know that toxic immune molecules are present in the brain and around the brain in the fluid that can kill neurons. We know there's a buildup of iron in neurons, which is not good for neurons. It increases with age and could kill them. We know that there's nerve fiber loss due to a, a rush of calcium ions into the nerve fiber. And we know a bit about that now. now the important question to me here is, are these all independent or are they linked? Are all these things going on independently or does one lead to another, to another, to another? That's very, actually very important when you're developing drugs. Because let's say for the sake of this argument that each one of those mechanisms is causing 20% of the progression, the disability buildup. If we found a drug just for one of them that blocked one of them, and they're not linked, 
then we're only going to get 20% benefit if it works perfectly. We add a drug in for another one, another 20% benefit. We're going to get 40% benefit. Whether we actually see this in a clinical trial is questionable because of the noise, the heterogeneity within the population. However, if, and it is an if, one of these mechanisms leads to the others, i.e. toxic immune molecules damaging mitochondria, leading to build-up of iron, leading to neuronal death, and down this side as well, and this is only hypothetical, and we can block that one, and block it well, could we have 100% benefit? So we need to know how these different mechanisms work together. So us as scientists, we, we always have a favorite mechanism, and we need to join them together to actually get maximum benefit for um, improving drug therapies. So what I want to talk about is what we have done in my group now to address this question. Is, is there a major point up here that we can intervene at that might stop a lot of the damage going on in the MS brain? And for this in our group, we started with using human tissues. So these are human brains donated, uh, well, a per, uh, given consent for donation while a person is still alive and we brought them into the MS Tissue Bank at the Imperial College after they've died. And I'm going to talk about how we've used some of that tissue, okay? But why is it important to study the human brain? Well, obviously its complexity is absolutely incredible. I won't use any, any analogies of how many, if you unraveled all the nerve fibers, how long it would be. I think Robin did that last year very well. Um, but it is incredible, and it's, it's more complex than an animal brain, for example. And we can use human brain imaging, and we can get a lot of information about that from a person who's alive. But it's not going to get us down to individual molecules and individual cells yet. We can develop models of MS in animals, but animals don't get MS, so they're, they're never perfect models, but they're very important for testing our ideas. We can look at cells from the brain grown in a dish, in a cell culture dish. And that is a very useful technique for allowing us to test our ideas, but it's not the same as the human brain. We can use computer modeling. It assumes that we know what's happening in the real brain, of course, to be able to model it, but we're partway there, and we use computer modeling in our own research, and we use all of these techniques in our research. But for the initial idea, we turn to looking at the human brain. That is very big on this screen, isn't it? <laughs> wow. And that is part of the human brain, <laughs> a brain that was brought into the tissue bank at Hammersmith Hospital. And what I want to concentrate is what is happening on the outside here. It's your so-called grey matter, which, sorry to disillusion you, it's not grey. It's kind of pinky colour. There's the white matter where all the myelin sheaths are, the myelinated fibres are. But I want to focus on what's happening in the grey matter, and particularly these kind of areas here down these folds in the brain because this is where your neurons live. These important cells, these cells accept in all the information from the outside world via your eyes, ears, sense of smell, touch, etc., etc., and then they generate the output, be it a thought, a change in behavior, a movement, another sensation, etc., etc. These are the vital cells that allow us to um, think, basically. And each one of these is remarkable in itself. It's like a little computer. Each one of these, particularly in some areas of our grey matter, can be accepting message in, messages in from 100,000 other cells. It's that complex. And there's billions of these. So that's why, where the complexity comes from. So we ask the question, what is happening to these cells, the neurons in the MS brain? So we started to look at the neurons in the MS gray matter from a group of brains, um, from people who had MS. And I asked a student, a PH2 student of mine, uh, Roberta, to count neurons in 30 different brains, in every layer of the cortex, because it's a layered structure, um, only in one brain area, thankfully, 
her. And uh, it's a rotten thing to do, but the information was vitally important. Um, she still talks to me. And uh, she's running her own research group now in Verona, which is fantastic, on MS, which is really good. So she counted all these cells. So what did she find when we looked at the numbers of these cells, just the numbers? To cut a long story short, her entire PhD in 10 seconds, um, we f she found that neurons are being lost in the gray matter in the brain during progression, the neurons themselves. And when MS was progressing more rapidly, more were being lost, up to 70% in some areas of the brain in more rapidly progressing cases. This is at the end of life, remember. So it has happened over decades. And the faster that they appear to be lost, the more rapidly MS progresses. So this really concentrated our minds on what's happening to these cells. Why are they being lost? And for those of you science people out there, the scientists, there, is, there are some numbers for this. So basically the black bars are the more rapidly progressing MS cases, and they've lost more neurons, up to 70, 67% on average, which means some even more. And for those who doubt that this is possible, that is, this is a case of mild MS, and you can see all these brown neurons sitting here, lots of them, and this is a case of more severe MS at end of life. Lots of gaps where the neurons have now disappeared. Not an uncommon finding. I've looked at 700 MS brains now, and it's not that uncommon to see that. So what's happening to these cells? This is it. Neurons get even larger on this screen, don't they? Um, these are very large cells. These are some of the largest cells in your body. So what's happening to these cells? Why are they being lost? Why are they dying in the MS brain? And one of the first indications we got, you might think is unexpected. We were working with a research team in, Vro in Rome, in Italy, and uh, we noted some changes in the covering that goes around the brain. So I brought an example here, just because I said it looks like cling film, because it really does. Your brain is covered by these thin membranes called the meninges, and that's where meningitis comes from, the term infection of the meninges. And it's really like cling film. This is not a real one, before you <laughs> decide to faint, and I have seen that happen. Um, it's a layer of tissue around the outside of the brain that both protects the brain, but also it holds the cerebral spinal fluid in between those tissues and the brain itself. Okay, so the whole of your brain is bathed by this fluid, cerebral spinal fluid, in this gap in here, and the meninges are the tissue layers. And if you want an analogy, this is actually a real picture. This is a picture a very high magnification of the brain, and this is the space around the brain with the fluid in that protects your brain, and the meninges are these bits of tissue in here. It's very much like the Lord of the Rings forest. I think you'll agree. So I nabbed a bit of a picture off um, <laughs> one of the films, and indeed it is very much like the Lord of the Rings forest. I think there's someone in there somewhere. Yeah, yeah. And um, what we found, together with the team in Rome, is that... Uh, the, Immune cells were building up in this space. And they're becoming trapped inside these spaces when they were down in the folds in the brain. And as I'll go on to show, they're releasing toxic molecules. And this is just a real example of that. The brain is either side here. This is a fold in the brain. The fluid from the cerebral spinal fluid is here. And these are B lymphocytes, white blood cells, building up in large aggregates in that space. They shouldn't be there. So these are producing molecules that are likely to damage the underlying tissue, which, if you remember, all the neurons are just underneath this. And one of the things that happens was that the kind of barrier that separates the brain from the cerebral spinal fluid here gets damaged as well. It's this layered, very thin layer on top here. And there you can see the layer is now very thin. And here are the immune cells sitting in here. So now there's less barrier to stop all the toxic molecules moving into the brain. So this is the kind of scenario we've got. This is my model. Poor artistic talent, I admit, but um, I couldn't afford a, a graphic artist. So unlike relaxing remitting MS, when immune cells are rapidly moving across this barrier and causing acute problems, 
They've stopped doing that, and now they're building up in the spaces around the blood vessels and in this space the meninges lying over the brain and releasing molecules which either damage tissue directly or cause other cells within the brain to release molecules that might damage the tissue. And the more cells you find in the space, the more rapid the progression of MS. So what do we do next to work out what molecules were actually damaging the brain? Uh, we use a very uh, high-tech piece of equipment called a scalpel and um, dissect it out because the human brain is big. It's one of the good things about it. It's not the size of a mouse brain where you have to look down a microscope to see things. The human brain is quite big. So you can cut out these areas where these immune cells are. And then you can extract all the proteins from them. You take the genetic material out of them and ask the questions such as which genes have been turned on in this area, and which ones have been turned off, which proteins are being produced, etc., and which of these proteins are damaging the neurons. At the same time, we can also measure them in the cerebral spinal fluid we take at the same time we retrieve the brain postmortem, and measure them in cerebral spinal fluid taken at diagnosis of people with MS. And what did we find? Well, this is a horrible diagram for those of you who are not scientists, that we measured 67, no, 60, yeah, 67 different molecules in the cerebral spinal fluid. The bad ones that might damage the cells are down this end. The ones that are more reparative and, and, and dampen down inflammatory activity are here. And this group of MS patients had more damage on their MRI scans. They were progressing a bit more rapidly. And there you can see higher levels of the damaging molecules whereas this group of MS patients had much milder MS, and they've got more of the more um, suppressive molecules that suppress the immune system. So what's really happening is you've got a toxic cocktail party going on here. The brain is being bathed in some sort of toxic mixture. And we're not talking about one martini, or whatever your favorite cocktail is. There's too many to think about, aren't there? This is what's happening. Apparently, in the, in, in the trade, if you drink this, it's a, known as a train wreck. <laughs> I can see why. But this is the kind of thing that's going on in MS. There's a lot of molecules in there, not just one, that together could be causing the damage. So how do we begin to dissect that potent combination? We worked out that there's three major ones we think are contributing more to that damage than others. I've called them names, um, sweet poison here. Tumor necrosis factor, or TNF. And this just shows in this diagram that this, these red bars, there's much higher levels of this in MS patients who are progressing more rapidly. Killer B, interferon gamma. Again, the same picture, very high levels in those patients who were developing worse MS. And finally, zombie. Not got a nice name to pronounce this one. Chemokine CXCL13, whose levels are much increased and normally not there at all in the normal brain and in people who've got very mild MS. So these are the three that we've been studying. And they are linked because this one tends to induce the production of this one, which then leads to the buildup of immune cells and produce this one. So they're linked in some way. So could we then see that these, these molecules were actually damaging the brain? So we got our scalpel again, and we cut out bits of the underlying brain underneath where these immune cells were that are producing those molecules. And we asked the question, which genes have been turned on and which have been turned off in this area and which proteins are being produced? Now, for those scientists here, we'll tell you this is not a, the experiment's quick. Analyzing all the results of that is a, takes a long time. And this was a number of years ago, so it produced about 720,000 bits of information. So to cut a very long story short, because it took us about five years to understand what was going on, I've drawn this diagram. And you'll think, oh, that's horrible. That's the scientific diagram. This is what we call a signaling diagram, and I'll explain it in a minute. But what this told us was that um, TNF was playing a major role inside the brain itself as well. And there's two forms of TNF. To put it crudely, bad TNF, which is that which is soluble, it's floating around in the fluid around your brain, 
or good TNF which is stuck on a cell. It's associated with a cell. And when this bad TNF binds to its receptor, it can stimulate cell death in two different ways. This way is the thing, is a, a form of cell death that normally happens while your brain's developing and your neurons are dying off because you don't need them anymore. It's modeling the brain, whereas this occurs when there's inflammation in the brain. What is a signaling diagram? Just to, just to help you here, what it means is this sticks to this, which sticks to that, which sticks to that, which then sticks to that. A couple of these come in, stick to each other. Then you get a few more sticking to each other, and then you get a signal. That's it. That's all you need to know in that respect, okay? And what we found in the MS brain is that this pathway that had been turned on that leads to neuron and oligodendrocyte death, where there was more neuronal loss. And this one was more turned on in very mild MS. So this is actually a neuroprotective pathway and can stimulate remyelination and dampen down the immune system. But it's this one that was turned on. And it's these sticky proteins that stick together. They're actually the death signal for the neurons. They stick together. They go to this side of a cell. They put themselves into this, the cell membrane, and they kill the cell. That's probably all we need to know at that point. Could we see this happening in the MS brain? So we took MS brains, and we made very thin slices of them, and we measured this death signal. And we could find that this death signal was increased in 31 MS brains that we looked at in those areas, where it's not produced at all in the normal brain, you'll be glad to hear. And we could show that these brown dots here are neurons that are expressing this death signal, which we think are about to die. There's lots of other neurons here which are healthy. They look okay. Okay, so it's happening slowly over time. We counted them. And we could even see that when this molecule that sticks to its own self several times produces a big, basically a lump of these uh, multiple molecules stuck together. This then goes into the cell. It, it moves to the outside of the cell and kills the neuron. You won't know, but I know this neuron's not very happy. It's sick. It's rounded up, and it's probably about to burst. And it's because of this signal in here. So the answer there was yes. We can see this happening in the MS brain. So, what happens if we do this in an animal? Can we raise the level of these molecules in the CSF around the rat brain and get the same result? So, are we right in our idea? And what we found was, put it very crudely, over one to two months, and we've taken it to three months as well, yes, the answer to that is yes, we get the same damage. We get loss of myelin around the outside of the brain, seen here in red, in the rat brain when we do this. I haven't got time to go over all the numbers, but we've counted them and see it, it accumulates with time. And neurons are dying in the, in the brain as well. Seen here, uh, there are some neurons still in this area, but there's a lot missing, and there's patches here where they're gone as well. When we raise the levels of these toxic molecules in the CSF around the outside of the brain. And that just shows that over time, you get a loss of neurons over time. And if you took this out further, it would look a lot more like the original pictures I showed you in MS. They're dying by the same way, by these toxic <coughs> molecules accumulating. And the rats begin to develop these kind of walking difficulties over several months, slowly. They're waddling, actually, by two months. So developing a, a walking difficulty. So the answer is yes, we do see something similar. Um, to what we think is happening in the MS brain. So what now, if we go back to that diagram, we think that this may be leading to some of the other mechanisms that are going on in the MS brain. Can we block this step to build up the disability, to stop the buildup of disability? So that's kind of where we've got to at the moment. The good news here is that, um, excuse me a moment. It's thirsty work, this. Um, We've been talking about our results at meetings, and we were approached by a drug company who... Uh, drug company is actually probably too big a word from them. They, they have one molecule at the moment, one drug. <laughs> They're American, small American biotechnology company, and they came to us and they said, we think we've got exactly the molecule you need to do what you want to do, which is great, because usually we have to go to them to find out what they've got. And it works like this. This molecule 
will bind to the bad TNF, stop it binding to its receptor, and the idea is it's blocking the death of neurons and inflammation, but it doesn't affect this good pathway that protects neurons, can stimulate remyelination, and regulates the immune system, in theory. So if we block this, we leave the good part still working and just block the damaging pathway. Please excuse the American accent. Is a novel TNF blocker. The effects of bad TNF oh, we can't occur hear it. Don't only worry. when three identical it's soluble TNF proteins what it's come showing together. Expro 1595 This is the drug molecule. TNF proteins. And it can result, now bind and Expro knock this bad TNF off. It binds to it, but it stops it binding to its receptor. It won't stay there, therefore the TNF doesn't work now. But it can't affect the, t the good TNF that's attached to the membrane to of a cell. Okay? So... We're at a very early stage now, together with my colleagues, Professor Richard Nicholas and Dr. David Owen, we just um, uh, designed the trial, and uh, the, drug, the biotech company have agreed to fund it all, which is fantastic. This is a safety trial, so it's a very early stage trial that you have to do to make sure the drug is safe, but also give you an early indication of whether it does what you think it is going to do. So we're looking forward to um, starting this trial. It's a small trial of only 30 people but that's usual for this early stage phase trial. So what I've told you is really how we've gone from human tissue through all this process of identifying our drug target to an early stage clinical trial. It has taken us 12 years. And this is the kind of not unusual time scale from your first idea to a clinical trial. This has all required um, good quality human brain material that has been collected in the, human, in the MS tissue bank at the Imperial College. And the MS Society have been fantastic at funding this over the last 20 years. This is a very vital and precious gift to research. We've collected 840 brains now and have 4,500 donors signed up around the UK. And as I say, it's a 20-year journey, this one and costs about 620,000 a year. The MS Society has been fantastic in funding it since its inception. And the tissue goes out all over the world to researchers all over the world, literally. Um, to Australia, it takes three days. You might fly in 24 hours, but to get a package of tissue out there takes three days because it sits in airports at times. Last two slides. What do we need to do this kind of research? Um, if you recognize, that's a Model T Ford. And um, Henry Ford was a great dreamer. He had great ideas. And when he really needed to expand his factory because he couldn't produce Model T Fords fast enough, he got a time and motion study people to come in to the factory. And they walked through the factory and they said, oh, that guy's not working hard enough, or that, that bit doesn't really work. And he came across a guy doing that. <laughs> There's a real story, this. And um, he said, well, he's got to go. He said, you can change anything you want in my factory. You will not change that guy. You cannot remove him. Here's my dreamer. Here's the one who comes up with the ideas in the first place. The reason I'm putting this up is that the MS Society has been fantastic, and I'm you know, happy to thank them for this. For, I'm a dreamer. Robin's another one. We've got a few more along here, dreamers, basically. We have to come up with the ideas. And the MS Society have directly funded us at various times in our career, which has been fantastic, and we thank them for that. But then there's the dream makers. <laughs> These are the guys actually doing the work. Um, it's mostly my group. There's some of Paolo Morara's group. Paolo's in the, in the audience somewhere. Sorry for stealing some of your members. And I think some of them might even be in the audience here. Um, we need to do this. We need gifted and passionate young scientists to carry out this research. And the MS Society has a number of schemes to support them, and many of these people have been funded by the MS Society throughout their career, as I have, and the members of the Tissue Bank, as well, shown here. And our lab motto, do it with passion or not at all. And with that, I thank you. very much. Um, I, I just want to say a huge thank you, Richard, to, for such an inspirational lecture and uh, 
to give us really exciting updates on, on your progress. Uh, I'm Dr. Susan Kohas. I'm the uh, Director of Research at the MS Society, and I want to, at this point, thank As both Asana and Richard for, um, for speaking tonight. Um, and I want to invite uh, Richard, as well as a few of our other uh, MS researchers, up onto the stage for a live <laughs> Q&A. Um, so we can ask them some quiz you <laughs> and ask you some questions um, and get a little bit of debate going. So I'll introduce you as you come up. Please do have a seat, Richard. I will, I will, I will. I've been told I have to stand close because I'm not mic'd up. I came a bit late. Can I take my brain um, Oh, please do take that with you. <laughs> um, thank you. <coughs> so I'll just quickly um, introduce our, our panel of scientific ambassadors. So um, here we've got uh, Anna Williams, who is Chair of Regenerative Neurology and Honorary Consultant Neurologist at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, we've got Jeremy Tatoe, who's NIHR Research Professor and Professor of Neurology at uh, UCL, University College London. Um, we've got, uh, so, oh, I can see you now, Rona Moss Morris, who is Professor and Chair of Psychology as Applied Medicine and Head of Health Psychology at King's College London. Uh, Richard Reynolds, who you all hopefully know by now. Um, then we've got Professor Olga Ciccarelli, uh, NIHR Research Professor and Professor of Neurology at University College London. And finally, last but not least, Professor Robin Franklin, um, who's Professor of Stem Cell Medicine at the University of Cambridge. Um, so I think we're delighted to have such an esteemed panel of research, you know, world-class researchers who are dedicating their careers to finding solutions for people with MS. So I'll start off um, <coughs> whilst we're waiting through some questions. And please do submit your questions on Slido as you have them. Um, I'll start off with the questions that have been, been asked, a few questions that be, have been asked. So one is um, about how, how much do we know now about MS research? So what, so what, what are the kinds of things that we've been finding out? Um, how are we going to uh, protect lost axons, uh, and how are we going to regenerate myelin? So I'm going to start with Richard, uh, and then probably move on to Anna and Robin. Um, no let up. <laughs> OK. Um, as I think I said in my lecture, I think we know a lot now. We actually know a lot about which molecules might be damaging various cells, how those cells are being damaged. It's now a matter of piecing it together to some extent and actually identifying drug molecules that can intervene at all those points and testing them. I think we're at the point now where, and I th certainly true the Robin, Robin's research as well, where we're, molecules have now been identified that might be good drugs, and now they're being tested at early stage clinical trials. So I think a lot of the research we've been doing over the last 20 plus years is actually coming to fruition now. Whether those drugs actually work is the next step, of course, and I'm sure not all of them will do, but I think there's a good chance that some of them will. And, and when we talk about myelin regeneration, I don't know, Robin and Anna, if you want to come in and talk about some of the discoveries we've been making in the lab uh, in that area as well. I go first. So um, we've, we now understand a lot better how oligodendrocytes can make myelin and how oligodendrocytes can remyelinate axons. So you could say um, we need to tackle this problem in two ways. It would be nice to turn off the damage of the axons and the neurons, but um, it would also be nice to turn on the myelin repair, so to tackle it from two sides and basically get to the same answer, I think. If you can put myelin back, you should be able to protect nerves. So we've made big progress on, on this. I've only been working in this area for 10 years, Robin, a bit longer. But, um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> only a bit longer. Um, <laughs> But I think one of the things we've done recently is actually discover that oligodendrocytes are not all the same and that there may be some that are better at doing it than others, and that's something we've been contributing to. So you know, if we can understand the biology better, we can then be able to understand the pathology, so what goes wrong in the disease better. We should be able to target it better to actually help patients in the long run. Your turn. Um. 
So, so, I, I'm, I'm going to be repeating what Richard and, and um, Anna already said, um, but in another way. Uh, so, so, so we know that, that myelin regeneration does take place in the human brain. I mean, it's, some, it, it's a regenerative process that does occur. It's, in, and in that sense, you know, MS is, is, is a good target for regenerative interventions because if you lose nerve cells, as, as Richard sort of intimated, they're gone and they're gone forever, so there's no regenerative capacity for nerve cells. And, and I was reminded, actually, by um, Hilary Sears of, of an analogy that I've used in the past about what we've been trying to achieve over the last more than 10 years. Um, uh, and um, the analogy is, is, is your car breaking down. So you're you know, whizzing along and your car breaks down and you pull over and you lift up the bonnet. And in order to fix the problem, you, you, you have to diagnose what the problem is. But actually, you're in no capacity to, to understand why your car's broken down unless you understand how the car works, how the internal combustion engine works. So, so that's really been our philosophy. First of all, you have to understand how myelin regeneration works in the first instance. And if you understand how it works in the first instance, then you understand why it, it breaks down. If you understand why it breaks down, then you're in some position to fix it. And so actually, um, this whole path from, from, from the, the, the we've engaged in Cambridge in collaboration with our colleagues in Edinburgh and elsewhere has really been in the first instance to understand the fundamental biology of how myelin regeneration takes place. Uh, and you know, that, 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 that is where the MS societies have had, has had considerable foresight in, in, in funding fundamental research, which at that point seems very remote from treating any patient. But that is the start of the journey. You have to understand how things work, and then you understand where they fail, and if you understand where they fail, then you end up in the position we're in now, where we've made this critical transition from laboratory studies into the, the first clinical trials in, in, in patients aimed specifically at regenerating myelin protecting neurons, and that would be a therapy for progressive disease. Great. Um, my next question is, is really probably best for Jeremy to answer. So well, I'll try and roll two questions into one if I can. So the first part of that is, what opportunities are there for people with progressive MS to take part in clinical trials? And the second part is, how close are we to helping people with MS, progressive MS, who've lived for a really long time with it um, as well, and, and how close are we to trials with progressive MS? Yeah, okay, so I think this is um, a very optimistic time for clinical trials. There's lots going on, and I think, as everyone has said, you can see how this fantastic and detailed understanding of the biology, which we now have achieved and achieving, is ready and is ripe to take into clinical trials. So the actual do the test in human beings with multiple sclerosis to check to see if these therapies work. And it's a fantastic time now because the pipeline is rich. And I think the first couple of slides that Richard showed demonstrated how far we've come over the last 20 years with relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis. And you can see now how we're going and how the green shoots are beginning with progressive multiple sclerosis. So there are a number of trials ongoing and about to start in progression. So the MS-STAT-2, the simvastatin trial that I'm involved with, is up and running around the country. We have 400 people randomized and taking place already. We aim to get to 1,100 patients. We have up to 30 centers around the UK randomizing, taking part, large and small people with progressive multiple sclerosis. My colleague Klaus Schmierer, who's in the front here, is starting towards the end of the year a trial of cladribine, working particularly with those who can't walk but have upper limb function to protect and to work in that group of patients. We have remyelinating trials beginning. So this actually is a fantastically rich time for trials and trials activity. And as you're well aware, there's a highly ambitious program the MS Stop campaign leads towards to do a platform, an engine of trials which will just keep on going until we've moved on that slide in progression from the right to the left, and it mirrors what we have now in relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis. I think it's quite a remarkable time in the therapeutics of multiple sclerosis and here in progressive multiple sclerosis in particular. So in terms of what we have now, so there has been success and there is success that's gone through the regulatory authorities. So ocrelizumab now has a license for 
primary progressive multiple sclerosis, a drug called siponamod, which is a brother drug of fingolimod, has a license now in the States for secondary progressive multiple sclerosis. So it is beginning the journey to push back on progressive multiple sclerosis. And I think it's the most optimistic time I've ever seen. And I think it's extraordinary. Yeah, I would agree with that. I started at the EMS Society about 10 years ago, and the slide that Richard showed would have been pretty much empty. Um, and it's great to see treatments coming on through the, um, through the pipeline. Um, I have... So yeah. Want to get so the question from Trishna in the audience is, what, where can people go um, if they want to get involved in trials? And yeah. I don't know if, Jeremy, you want to... Well, the, the MS on? STAT2 trial, for example, has a dedicated portal. The MS Register yeah. supports trials. The MS Society has its own trials page. So, so yes, go on there and get involved. And now is the time for these trials. Of course, it won't, a trial won't be suitable for everyone, but that is the way to get the information, and really the effort is in progression and remyelination, building on this work, this 20-year journey, and I think it's really now coming up to the boil. So I've got another question that I'm going to uh, take two different ways. So, so it's about what happens when you move from relapsing MS to progressive MS. Um, so how, how do you know when you've moved from relapsing MS to progressive MS? Um, and then uh, the second part of that question really is, what are the ways uh, that people, what are the things, practical things that people can do day to day to help them manage that transition as well? So I'm going to ask the neurologists on the panel to, um, to comment on what's happening uh, when people are moving from relapsing MS to progressive MS. And I'm going to ask Rona uh, to come in and talk about the practical things that people can do now to help them manage that. So shall we start with Olga? So yes. So to address the question about what happens when people um, experience this transition from relapsing emitting MS to secondary progressive MS, mainly is when the main feature of the disease is not more episodes of acute deterioration and then followed up by improvement, but when the main determinant of disability is this low progression of neurological problems. Uh, obviously, it's very difficult to say this happens on this specific time. It's usually an exercise which is retrospective. So people tend to say, well, you know, last year or two years ago, I was able to do that. Now I'm not able anymore, but I didn't have any acute episodes. I cannot say when I got worse. And this is basically when we say that the disease has changed. The main characteristics have become progressive. And then I think... Rona is going to address the second part of the question. Yeah, it's quite a big question. I'll do my, yes. <laughs> do, do, do my best in a very short space of time without keeping you here for the next hour. Um, so I guess what, what can you do on a practical level? Well, I, I suppose one of the things that we know is that people who have a good social support network around them generally do better with any, with, with any crisis or any particularly difficult time in their lives. So being able to access and use one's social support, I think, is a very important part um, of, of the practical day-to-day. -day. And some people might have actually quite a lot of social support around them, but not be very good at using it. So I think there's one thing about the structure of having it there, but then it's also being very good at accessing it and letting people know when you need it. So that's one thing. But the reality is not everybody has that sort of structure. And I think that one of the things that we need to address as healthcare professionals, and I think we still have quite a long way to go, is to make sure that the right um, support is available for people with MS, and that's what a lot of my work is involved in, is how do we actually change and shift services so that they don't only focus on the biomedical side, which I'm not saying is not extremely important, it clearly is, but that actually we also make treatment integrate into being able to provide people with psychological and social support when they need it. Um, I guess the other thing that we have known we, that we have found that really helps the adjustment process is also spending a little bit of time thinking about your life and what you most value and what are the things that are most important. And rather than trying to do everything, is to try and to work how with the shifting and adjusting physical condition and, and the cognitive um, condition sometimes too. How do we retain the things that are most important to us and put and channel the energies um, into those things? So there's various methods and techniques that we can take people through that journey and, and help them um, manage that side of it. So, so it, it really is a very big question. There's, there's lots of bits and pieces. I think 
as I'm saying, both at the kind of individual level to learn strategies, but I think, again, I think this is a big issue for the healthcare professional professions and the NHS as to how we um, help people a little bit more in these circumstances. Great. Um, the next question uh, is kind of a more general one, and I'll let you guys volunteer about who takes this one. Um, maybe several of you will want to, but when will people with MS reap the benefit of the Stop MS Appeal? Uh, will anybody in the room still be alive? Um, so who would like to take that <coughs> first? So, so, so the first question is when? When, yeah. yeah I, I, I think now. I think we're realizing potential right now. Trials are, are happening, trials are beginning. The brilliant experimental work you've heard about, psychosocial work, it's right now. And it will only increase. And the more fuel we put in the engine, the faster we'll get there. And we will get there. The slides that Richard so brilliantly shown will be full on the left side. So I think it's happening right now. Okay. Yeah, and what, one of the main reasons for Stop MS Appeal is, is money for that stage. That when you've, you've done your basic research and now you need to test a molecule um, in early stage clinical trials and then full clinical trials, that's what Stop MS Appeal is about. So it's already happening now. You're already getting benefits for, say, for example, the trial that that Robin Franklin was talking about last year and has mentioned again, that, that is funded because of this kind of appeal. So it's already happening. Mm. Yeah. Okay, we've got time for a couple more questions. So I'm gonna ask uh, this one again. I think it'd be nice if uh, several people on the panel could answer it. What's the most frustrating thing about MS research or about research and what's the most rewarding thing? <laughs> and as an ex-researcher, I could, I could probably <laughs> Uh, come in. So what are the, the frustrations and rewards? Can I start with the reward? Yes. I think... <laughs> Please do. <laughs> I think an evening like tonight is really rewarding because it's really nice to see so many people committed. You're taking a lot of time out of your free time, your evenings, your weekends to do this for, for us, for scientists who need funding to carry out our research, but also for people with MS in general to support. I think this is very rewarding. Thank you very much. <laughs> I leave others to deal with challenges. <laughs> I have now. <laughs> Shall I go for uh, challenges? Go yeah. Go so um, I also find research very re rewarding, but it's a different time scale. So I'm also a neurologist, and you do a, a clinic, and you see 10 people, and you make decisions, and you get fairly quick outcomes. In research, you do something, you do it again, and you do it again, and then again, just to make sure it can take months years to do it and that can be massively frustrating now I know it's frustrating for you because you want the, the treatments out yesterday and that's perfectly reasonable but it's also frustrating for us because we want to know the answers and we want to get it to you but that is frustrating but then when it does work it's fantastic so it's very exciting I think it's a very exciting time yeah mm. I'd agree with that I think very basically, when your experiment works, it's rewarding. <laughs> when it doesn't, it's frustrating. <laughs> and you will probably find that three out of four times it doesn't work necessarily because you can't predict everything. The other thing that I find incredibly rewarding is actually training young scientists um, to carry on MS research. You know, we're not going to be... I'm probably older than Robin, but we're not going to be here forever. We need to train other young people to carry on from us, and that is very rewarding, actually. Yeah. So that, that follows on to another question we've had, actually, really nicely. So where is the next generation of dreamers? Where are they coming from? And how can we support well, hopefully them? Hopefully some, some are in the audience, I would hope. <laughs> um, I think they are <coughs> young researchers, scientists, clinicians, physiotherapists, radiologists, all the skills... And I think it's up to all of us, all of us in this room, to inspire and make sure and enable and educate and mentor and make sure they follow into the path of doing research in multiple sclerosis. Because what we've seen over the last 20 years would not have been achieved without that. So I think it's up to all of us to inspire and ensure that this happens. Great. And I have one last question. Um, that I'd like to ask each member of the panel. Um, so, you know, 15 years ago, that slide that Richard showed would have been empty. 
uh, or virtually empty. And now we see it full of, of treatments that are coming through the pipeline. So where would each of you like to see us in the next 10 or 15 years? Not an easy one, <laughs> but let's start with Anna and move along. Right. So can I just, where we want to see the MS Society or where we want to see MS Research? MS Research and okay. progress in it. Okay, so I think what we need to do is, actually I think probably rethink this binary idea of having relapsing remitting MS and progressive MS and there's a <coughs> time point that you switch from one to another and you switch from one drug and then go to the other drug. I think we'll see it more as a, um, a multi levels thing so we'll have drugs to reduce your immune system we'll have drugs that probably start relatively early to stop your nerves dying and you'll have drugs for repair and they'll all come in um, over the course of the disease rather than a switch because I think the switch is quite difficult psychologically for patients but actually I think it's unnecessary I think we need to go early so I would say that what we'll see is a, um, a combination therapy for MS with immune drugs, anti-nerve death drugs, and pro-myelin repair drugs. And I think that will happen within that. So those combination treatments. A combination of yeah. treatments. Okay, how about you, Derby? Well, I was going to say the same, so, oh. so, <laughs> so thanks, Anna, that's been great. <laughs> so I'll say the same, but I, I, think, I think perhaps moving on and sort of personalising that combination over time for the individual person, what is required where, so that we can, we can work out where to go and what to add, what to subtract. Okay. But I think very much the combination of treatments addressing the different mechanisms. Great, and Rona? And I, I think probably following on from that from a slightly different vein, I'd like to see much more integration between mind-body in terms of treatments and what's on offer and greater research understanding of how these things impact. I think we had a wonderful example with our first speaker about exercise and, you know, there, there's a lot of other ways that we can help people in terms of doing things differently in terms of their behaviour, maintaining healthy lives in general, and I think there's not nearly enough focus on that and also how some of these factors might even downstream help, you know, prevent some of the progression or help you respond better to the medications and so forth. So in terms of treatment, I'd like to see treatment much more broadly defined. Brilliant. And Richard? I kind of think we're going to see a list of drugs on the right-hand side of that slide for progressive MS. I really do. Because, you know, I've been working on MS for over 35 years now and I've seen it change and I've seen things move across that slide. By the law of averages, if nothing else, some of it is going to go across to that sl the other side in the next 10 years, maybe faster. They might not be the perfect drugs, but they're going to be making a difference and improving quality of life, I think. Brilliant. And Olga? I think we are going to stop a mess. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. and, um, I'm a dreamer. <laughs> I'm a dreamer, but yes. Well, and I think, I think coming back to what Jeremy said, come, uh, trying to um, decide what is best for individual uh, person with MS, what drug to use, when, why, what dose, for how long. It's constant questions that at the moment we still cannot answer, and hopefully we will. Brilliant. And Robin, I would love to see you follow that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, actually, the reason I st sat on the end was because I thought you were going to go right to left. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, all of the above. Uh, I will add one additional thing that, that I hope in 10 to 15 years' time we'll have evolved into a society where brilliant young minds are given the opportunity and the freedom to dream and then we will treat this disease, we will treat disease more generally, and we'll have created a far better society. Great, wonderful. We did, we managed to follow that. Um, and I just want to thank everybody here on the panel tonight, not just for coming and talking to us about your answers, but also for all of your amazing work and dedication to MS research. It makes a huge difference, and it, I also want to thank the audience here. So we've talked a little bit about what your dreams are for um, the future for people with MS, but actually what's making that happen is the support and um, the support and dedication of all of our supporters in the MS community. So thank you very much as well for, for your amazing support. 
um, and for supporting the researchers that we have here today. Um, we will, uh, I think we're wrapping up now, but we will have um, the MS Society, members of the MS Society research team um, outside if you want to hang around a little while longer and ask some <coughs> questions. So I'm going to ask uh, the MS Society research team to stand up now so you can identify who they are. We've got a few of them, we've got a few shy ones as well. Um, so please do find them after the lecture and uh, ask them your questions. They're very, uh, you know, an absolute privilege to work with. So um, please do, please do use them whilst you're here. Um, and I want to thank our panel again before I hand over to Nick. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, well, if I may, I'd just like to add my thanks to Susan's. That was a really fantastic, uh, very uh, stimulating, but hugely inspiring session. Particular thanks, obviously, to Richard, but also to all uh, the colleagues on the panel. It really is an exciting time in MS research. I'd also like to thank you all for making uh, the time to be here this evening, because, of course, all that fantastic work relies on your support um, in order to fund it. Uh, and to make it happen. It really is a collaborative effort. So thank you all very much uh, for coming and being here this evening. Now, um, I'm pleased to say that um, our wonderful MS ambassadors are uh, going to be around after the lecture and are very keen to talk one-on-one uh, -on -one with any of you who would like to um, ask them some questions. And we'd also um, obviously also like to invite you to um, stay and uh, have, a, have a drink or two um, whilst um, chatting with the MS ambassadors and indeed the research team as well. Um, so you're very welcome to stay on afterwards. Um, so at this point, if I may, I'd like to ask you to uh, make your way to the, um, uh, the, the uh, exit of the lecture theatre and people will be on hand then to direct you to the reception area um, where drinks will be available. So thank you all very much. <laughs>